uh, welcome Yusuf Ahmed, uh, who's one of the interventional cardiologists at Yale. Uh, and uh, he, he joined us you know, after a period of training in Imperial College London, and then some further training in uh, Columbia and Cedar sinai and uh, uh, joined as Yale faculty. So uh, it's a pleasure again to welcome Yusuf. He's going to talk about an important topic about CTO-PCI. Thanks, Yusuf, for uh, giving this talk. Thank you very much, Karthik. So yeah, thanks to Rob and Karthik for inviting me to speak. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. I would love for this to be interactive, but I know it's a little difficult with Zoom, but if anyone wants to interrupt me at any stage, please feel free. When we sort of discussed to plan the session, um, we felt, I think that, you know, quite rightly, if we try and cover absolutely everything in one session from, you know, the rationale, the data, the indications, the risks, complications, and technical aspects, it, is a little much to cover in one session. So we will try to keep this as a focus on technical considerations and approaches. I'm gonna try and make it you know, broad and cover some fundamental principles. Um, there'll be some case examples you know, littered throughout and I'll try and you know, give a flavor for what a contemporary approach to CTO PCI is these days. Um, I'll aim, as I say, to be as practical as possible. It's impossible to cover all of this in one talk, but you know, I'm sure if there was appetite Glenn or myself would be happy to do other sessions at other times, you know, on any of the specifics, whether that's, you know, equipment, wires, microcatheters, whether it's step by step, how to do a retrograde. Um, we could get into sort of some of the more sort of nitty gritty stuff at other times. And I will say one brief thing about indications. I would say that the indications for CTO PCI are broadly the same as non CTO PCI and stable CAD and stable CAD is you know generally what we're speaking about when patients with CTOs I do think the threshold for offering PCI has to be higher when a patient has a CTO so the broad broad indications are the same but your threshold to intervene needs to be higher and that's because CTO PCI does carry an increased risk compared to non CTO PCI um, I think the procedure is getting safer and the risk is you know, individualized to each individual patient, depending on, you know, their risk profile and the actual specific anatomy. But even, you know, in every sort of published series, even in the highest volume programs and the most expert hands, there is an increased hazard. So we do need to bear that in mind. So as I say, I think the broad indications need to be the same, the, the threshold should be higher. And if a lesion warranted an attempt at PCI and crossing is unsuccessful, I'm not saying every single one of those patients should have a dedicated CTO attempt, but it should at least be thought about because at some point, you know, somebody thought that lesion was worth, you know, trying to, to work on. And this is just, you know, it's courtesy of like my old uh, supervisor, Dimitri, this is, you know, uh, a 55 year old male with angina, positive stress test, and this coronary anatomy. And this is his identical twin brother with exactly the same clinical profile. And we do treat these patients differently. That may be appropriate in some cases, but you know, should we really treat them so differently, so consistently is the question. Um, so you know, these in, are the indications that we have for any you know, patients in uh, stable CAD. And as I say, I think they, these are broadly the same for patients where you're considering proceeding on a occluded artery. CTO PCI, I think, can be confusing. There's a lot of different equipment compared to conventional PCI. There's a lot of different you know, acronyms and lexicon, and it can be a little bit overwhelming. I think it's incumbent on us to try and simplify it. And you know, the most simple way that I can explain it is that there are only four ways to cross a CTO. And those four ways depend on two things. One is the direction of the wire crossing, whether that's antegrade, which is you know, the direction of blood flow, the way we cross a non-CTO, or whether it's retrograde, which is when we use a collateral channel to cross in the other direction. And the other determinant is the passage we take within the architecture of the vessel. If we cross through the lumen the entire time, or whether we go around the occlusion into the subintimal space, or what's sometimes now called extra plaque, intentionally dissect and re-enter. And those are the only four ways to cross the CTO. So this is, you know, a schematic. If you cross in the antegrade dissection and you stay in the true lumen, we call it antegrade wire escalation. That's when you're using different wires to try and navigate the occlusion within the, the luminal segment. If we go into the wall of the vessel and dissect around in that same you know, forward direction, that's antegrade dissection re-entry. And if you're going backwards, it's the same two things, retrograde wire escalation if you stay within the true lumen throughout and dissection re-entry if you dissect 
and come back in. In terms of which of those four options we take, um, we always plan for multiple options. And you know, the key to a successful CTO procedure is efficiently moving both within a strategy and between strategies. And you don't want to get bogged down for you know 25 minutes trying to wire with one wire. I will say that the cases that we're most enthused about taking on are the cases which have multiple options. And you know that you know if you can't get this with anti-grade wiring and you feel that you know there's a good landing zone for a dissection re-entry or there are big septals to go retrograde those cases we feel good about we feel like this chance of success is high because we have multiple avenues open to us and conversely the cases which have you know limited options at the outset are the ones that we have most trepidation about if you have let's say a true aorto osteal occlusion it's very difficult to navigate that in the anti-grade approach. So you're already, you know, half of the approaches are not available to you. And if there are no interventional collaterals, then you may not have a retrograde option. Let's say you have a very, very non-dominant RCA and the occlusion is somewhere in the left coronary and there are no, you know, left to left collaterals. Then again, if you don't have any retrograde options, those are the cases that we feel a little bit, you know, less enthusiastic about. But how we, you know, decide our principal option is from a detailed analysis of the angiogram. These are, you know, very common factors, uh, the length of the occlusion, the longer the occlusion is, the harder it is going to be to wire luminally in an anti-grade fashion. And in fact, it's not necessarily safe to do that. It's safer to either take a retrograde approach or to dissect and re-enter rather than trying to navigate 100 millimeters of occlusion with, you know, stiff penetrative wire. So we look at the length of the occlusion. We look at the collaterals and we'll talk a little bit more detail about collaterals later, but when we look at them, we, we look at their course, whether they're septal or epicardial, how tortuous they are, um, what their insertion is like, the caliber of the, the collateral, and overall we deem them interventional or not. And an interventional collateral is one that you'd be happy to pass a wire and microcatheter through. We look at calcification, which, you know, has relevant um, implications, both for the chances of, you know, puncturing the occlusion and, and navigating the case luminally, but also if you want to dissect and re-enter, it's much harder to do in a calcified vessel. And we look at tortuosity, which, you know, increases the, the complexity of any coronary intervention, CTO or not. We look at what we term the proximal cap. So the proximal cap is the beginning of the occlusion, and people often discuss that a proximal cap is ambiguous. And that really just means that it's not clear either where the occlusion is exactly starting or the course the vessel takes after the occluded segment. Often the presence of a side branch at the origin of the proximal cap can make things a little bit more complicated that, for several reasons. One is your wire will wanna go down the path of least resistance. So if there's an occluded path or a non-occluded path, it's gonna favor the non-occluded path and go in the side branch. And the presence of the branches can make it hard to know exactly which direction the um, you know, true vessel runs. Conversely, if you have adequately sized side branches at the site of the occlusion, you can utilize them to your advantage. You can either put an IVUS wire and then an IVUS to show the location of the proximal cap, or you can use things like dual lumen microcatheters to help you puncture down in the direction of the occlusion. And we also you know, look at whether it's tapered or blunt. So a very blunt occlusion is harder for you to penetrate. Whereas if there's a little funnel or beak which leads you into the occluded segment, that's a more favorable configuration. The distal cap is you know, just the distal end of the occlusion, but that's what we call it. And the things we specifically look at is, you know, what's the caliber and quality of the vessel beyond the occluded segment? So is it severely calcified? Is there diffuse disease? All of those factors will make it more challenging for you to have a successful dissection re-entry approach. And if the dis distal cap is at the site of a major bifurcation, that also favors against dissection re-entry. When you dissect and re-enter, you have to dissect beyond the occluded segment and then re-enter in the normal vessel beyond. And if you do that beyond the major bifurcation and then you try and stent, you'll have you know, stents and then tissue layers and the chances of you occluding that major side branch are very high. There are various different scores. The JCTO score is probably the most commonly used one, and it's shown to predict how quickly you can wire an occlusion. And all those factors that we just discussed, lesion length, calcification, tortuosity, blunt stump, can go into it. And the other factor that goes into it is whether it's been previously attempted. So you can have a score anywhere from zero to five. So the JCTO zeros are normally fairly, hopefully straightforward anti-grade wiring cases. And once you get into fours and fives, then you know, these are the most complex occlusions.
And we integrate all of that information, what we call the hybrid algorithm. There are various different iterations of this, but essentially each case starts with dual injections, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. And then based on those factors that we've talked about, you know, the length of the occlusion, the presence of the collaterals, what the proximal cap and the distal cap are like, we'll choose our initial approach. And then, you know, we want to rapidly move between approaches if we're not having success. So this is a patient with, you know, an occluded right coronary artery. This is, you know, a single antegrade injection at the time of the diagnostic angiogram. Uh, I think you can see that it looks like the proximal cap is at the level of that side branch. Uh, it looks like a fairly long occlusion, although there's a trickle of forward antegrade flow into a stented segment. And stents can help, you know, with the geometry of the vessel because it can tell you at least where you need to go. This is the same patient. This is their left coronary injection. You can see a big septal collateral coming down. It takes a couple of bends, but the overall course is fairly straight uh, and it's a good caliber vessel. And there are some more proximal septals, which look like they could also be potentially navigated. And what we can see here is that the distal cap appears to be exactly at the bifurcation of the PDA and the PLA. So if I was just... Question. Yes. As a CTO specialist, what is what are the things that you wish the diagnostic angiographers, non-CTO people, would do during that diagnostic study to make your life easier? Number one. Number two is what's the role of, of non-invasive imaging for a procedural I didn't hear the second one. The role of non-invasive imaging for procedural planning. So that's both really good questions. So from diagnostic angiography, if you see uh, an occluded vessel, what we would really like is that when you're injecting the donor vessel, so the non-occluded vessel, let me go back and see, you go off mag so that you can see the entire you know, coronary circulation in one picture and you don't pan at all because it's very, very difficult for us to track the collaterals if there's panning. The views that are most useful is if you are, want to see septal collaterals where they originate from the LED is an ARIO cranial 2020. And if you want to see those same septals where they insert to the PDA, then a straight ARIO is very, very useful. The role of certain non-invasive imaging is, you know, we obviously want every patient to have an echocardiogram because we want to know the ejection fraction. Uh, that's going to be relevant for how you plan your procedure. There are certain patients, you know, with very low ejection fractions that I would consider not candidates for a retrograde procedure, either due to the, you know, the attendant risks of procedural ischemia when you're working through the collateral, depending on the particular anatomy. Some patients, even if you don't feel like you're causing ischemia, really do not tolerate equipment retrograde. So the ejection fraction is very, very important. Uh, viability is kind of a separate issue, and it's really no different for CTOs to non-CTOs in that, you know, if, you know, viability you know, studies aren't perfect, but, you know, if it shows that, you know, there's really what appears to be no viability in a territory, then you may be put off from intervening on it. Same if, if a huge territory subtended by an occluded artery lights up as an ischemic zone then, and the patient has, you know, symptoms concordant with that, then that would encourage us that it's, you know, worth persisting with. So to summarize that angiogram, I'd say an ambiguous proximal cap, the side branch is at the origin of the proximal cap, the distal cap is at the bifurcation of the PDA and the PLA. It's a very long occlusion. There are good interventional collaterals. So overall, synthesizing all of that information, I'd favor a primary retrograde approach. I would say that's notwithstanding a brief antegrade attempt in nearly every CTO. There are cases that I you know, did in fellowship where we would have this type of configuration. We would try and work retrograde for three hours, let's say, not have success, and then we'd flip to an antegrade approach. And sometimes you can be surprised. You don't know the exact chronicity of the occlusion, and you can find that your wire makes rapid progress. So I would say that most CTOs would favor at least a brief antegrade attempt, and that does mean brief. That means, you know, 30 seconds with a, a, a polymer jacketed wire and a microcatheter, and if you don't make progress, then go back to what you thought was the right approach. And the other thing I'd say is always be prepared to change your strategy on the day they come in for the CTO procedure, because you have the benefit of dual injections on the day of the CTO. Oftentimes you'll get new information. You'll see collaterals that weren't previously visible. You'll see the length of the occlusion might be less, much less than you anticipated. And sometimes just injecting the occluded vessel with an eight French guide, you get a lot better anti-grade flow. So although we always 
have planned every case in advance. We're always prepared to you know, pivot from that plan based on the dual angiography findings. This is that patient's dual angiogram. This is the you know, LEO projection. It really confirms what we saw on the previous you know, isolated diagnostics that it's a very long occlusion and that distal cap really is at the bifurcation. And this is that you know, areocranial view showing those septals and you can see you know, no panning, um, low magnification. We can see the entire coronary tree there. So dual angiography is mandatory in all CTOs. There are really very, very rare exceptions when there are no collaterals whatsoever, but you know, sometimes they, you don't think there are collaterals and there really are. And even if you think you have antegrade flow, once you put a wire and microcatheter down, you're gonna lose your antegrade flow as you plug the channel. And then the, you can get in a very sticky situation of no distal visualization and trying to make forward progress. So mandatory dual angiography in all cases, other than very, very, very few exceptions. Low mag so that we can see everything uh, at once, all of the collaterals, no panning because it's very difficult to track those collateral courses if there's any motion at all. You know, inject the donor vessel first, so the non CTO first, and when it fills, then you inject the occluded vessel and work out whatever your system is to distinguish your retrograde and antegrade, you know, systems. You can completely, you know, ruin your case by an inadvertent antegrade dissection at a uh, antegrade injection at a time when you either have a guide extension down or the damp pressure trace or you've already gone sub -intimal. So, you know, there are various different ways of doing this. I always mark, you know, with red stickers on the retrograde. So red is for retrograde and then blue on the antegrade. You can disconnect the contrast syringe once you reach a portion of the case where it's going to become hazardous if you get an inadvertent injection. And if you're in a place which has, you know, assisted manifold, and sometimes it's nice to have one of each, and you have the, uh, the assist as the retrograde, which would be the power injection, and the manifold as the antegrade, which you can control, and then it's harder to mix them up. But it really doesn't matter how you distinguish them. It's just important that you do and that everybody involved in the case knows which is which. Because as I say, you can ruin the case very rapidly with an inadvertent injection. Use a guide catheter as default for all retrograde injections. Uh, that's because you are then set up if you need to go retrograde, you have a guide catheter in. Uh, you also get better contrast to pacification. There are rare cases, and I think you know the fellows will have seen this here, there are cases where I will decide upfront that the patient is not a candidate for a retrograde procedure. And in those cases, I might just use a diagnostic for you know, the, the retrograde injections. I think it's important to try and make that decision ahead of time. Um, you don't want to be you know, two hours into a stressful case or you've been working, not making progress, and you're then trying to make a mental calculation as to whether a retrograde attempt is warranted and whether the patient can tolerate it. So I would say try and make that decision ahead of time. But otherwise, as default, I'll always use a guide catheter and I'll always use 90 centimeters so that, again, you're set up in case you need to go retrograde. If you use a longer guide catheter, you may run out of working room and not be able to deliver your retrograde equipment to the antegrade guide. And always place a stabilizing workhorse wire in the retrograde vessels and the donor vessel because there's always a risk of donor vessel complications. Generally, just you know, very small practical point. We engage the right coronary first because it tends to need more talking, and so you know you're less likely to knock out the other guide. So engage the right first, and then engage the left after that. And you know, yeah, these are the angiographic projections to see those septals, and then the other angiographic projections will depend on the particular artery that you're interrogating. Briefly on collaterals, you know, ipsilateral or contralateral, very intuitive, and then we define them by their course, which is septal, epicardial. Or a bypass graft. A bypass graft obviously is not strictly a collateral, but we can use it as a retrograde conduit. Septal collaterals course through the septum and not at the heart surface, and they're our most favorable, you know, conduit for retrograde CTO PCI. That's because the the fact they don't course at the heart surface. If you get a septal perforation, you'll bleed into the muscle, which is rarely of any consequence at all. So it's very very unusual for a septal perforation to cause tamponade. You can get staining and septal hematomas. These can cause some you know, chest pain and arrhythmia occasionally, but most often are of no consequence whatsoever. The exception to that is if you get a large septal hematoma close to the outflow tract, and then you can get a hokum type physiology and you may need to support the patient appropriately for the you know, one to two days that the hematoma takes to heal. The other reason we prefer septals or they're more favorable is that there's often many of them. 
And that number one increases your you know, options for crossing. If you work through one and it doesn't connect, you can just take another septal. But it also reduces the chances of you know, periprocedural ischemia because there are other collaterals taking the same course. And that's, you know, it converts to epicardials where there's often just one predominant one. And as well as the hazards of epicardials related to perforation, you're much more likely to get, you know, ischemia from occluding the, the single dominant collateral. Again, epicardials are more tortuous, septals tend to be straighter. So epicardials are inherently more hazardous. They obviously go on the heart surface. So perforation can lead to tamponade and that can happen very rapidly. They're also more tortuous and they can often get that, you know, sort of telephone cord appearance where they take several, you know, corkscrew turns one after the other. As I say, you're more likely to have a single dominant one. And if you do have an epicardial perforation, you need to, you know, occlude the vessel from both directions, the antegrade and the retrograde to stop the bleeding. A brief note about using bypass grafts. You can use either patent or occluded grafts as retrograde conduits. Occluded grafts, you know, the longer they've been occluded, the harder they are to navigate. But, you know, even old occlusions can be navigated potentially. If they're occluded, they obviously the risks of ischemia are less because it's an occluded graft. Uh, the graft insertions, you know, as we all know, often have severe angulation. So even when you navigate the graft, the touchdown into the native can be challenging. You may need angulated or dual lumen microcatheters. It may be hard to deliver your equipment. Veins, as we all know, are more prone to perforate than arteries, so we have to be careful when we're working in them. You can't advance that knuckled wire that we use safely, you know, to go into the wall of the vessel in an artery cannot be used in bypass grafts, for, you know, for the reason for the configuration of the veins. And a patent lemur to LED is not a contraindication as a, a retrograde channel. I do have cases that I can show that from fellowship where we did use them, but it really should be in exceptional circumstances and an option of last resort and really does need a very specific consideration and consent. Just a note about knuckled wires, which we talk about often in CTO PCI. This is where we intentionally um, dissect. So we enter the subintimal space with a polymer jacketed wire, which is prolapsed to form a bend, and then you advance it. And it's one of the safest ways to traverse long occlusions. A knuckle should not be exiting the vessel architecture. It exits the lumen to go to the wall of the vessel, but should not exit the vessel architecture. So is inherently less prone to perforation than a stiff penetrative wire. You know, not every rule has an exception and you can get cases with what's called an exploding knuckle. So you have to watch the behavior of the wire. But if you get a nice tight knuckle, which, you know, will show, I think I have a video here just so people can see through the microcatheter, polymer jacketed wire, it's going to fold on itself. And then you can advance that. And then you can safely see that we cover a very long portion of the right coronary with that maneuver. And we often, you know, have knuckled wires in both the antegrade and retrograde di directions. And this is the way that we navigate long occlusions often. So this is that same patient. I'll go through this case briefly. Um, this is a, a, you know, if you ever go to a CTO conference, you'll see every single patient is like this. They're, you know, treated with three or four antianginals, they have non-inducible ischemia, normal ejection fraction. Um, but this is the same patient who's got that long RCA occlusion and an old stent in the mid vessel, which I hope people can see. So our setup for this is we had bifemoral access, eight French sheaths in both, an eight French guide in the antegrade and a seven French in the retrograde. Again, a very small like practical point. If you have your one of your guides to be seven in eight, you can draw ACTs off the sheath because of the size discrepancy. That stops, you know, often one of your catheters is damped because it's, you know, wedged into an occluded artery. And the other one, the setup may be precarious. So if you don't want to take your ACTs from the coronary catheters, you can take them from the sheath. This is that same REO projection we saw earlier. You know, we're going to place a safety wire in the distal LAD, which is what we say we do in every case, always have a safety wire in the donor vessel. This is that five second antegrade attempt, which didn't work. So then we switched to retrograde. We engage the septals with, you know, low tip force wires, which are very easy to steer like a Sion wire. We follow with 150 centimeter microcatheters. And then in this case, we switched to a Sion black, which, you know, compared to the Sion is polymer jacketed. It also has a little bit more body to carry the equipment. And you can see it very rapidly cover that course of the septum and cross that. 
We then advance the microcatheter and this portion of the septum can be a little challenging sometimes to get your microcatheter across. So you have to be patient. You don't wanna stress the collateral by pushing there too hard and you wanna keep an eye on your retrograde guide catheter because you can push it out. Um, you then, you know, now we've advanced the microcatheter to the distal cap and you, you wanna to switch to what the wire that you wanna cross with. So in this case, we switch to medium tip load polymer jacketed wire, which is the gladius that crossed into the old stem. We then took an orthogonal view, and this is very important, this maneuver, when you're navigating occluded stents, you wanna check in two orthogonal views or do this you know, panoramic view to make sure your equipment is in within, within the lumen of the stent. It can be very easy with wires, particularly in undersized stents, to go behind um, stent strut. So if you can stay within the lumen of the stent, obviously that's preferable. And you can see up at this level now, our wire has crossed the occlusion, it's now in the aorta. So we can pause here to discuss options for retrograde crossing. There are two ways that you can complete the crossing retrograde. One is to wire the antegrade guide. I consider this the easiest and best option because if you wire the antegrade guide, you can trap that retrograde wire in the antegrade guide, which anchors everything in place and allows you to advance your microcatheter. Uh, you can bring down a guide extension to increase your target to try and for what you can wire with your retrograde guide, but it's not always possible. Sometimes you have, you know, an aorto osteal CTO, which, you know, makes it very, very difficult. Sometimes the proximal vessel is huge. And so there's a lot of places for the wire to go around the guide catheter. Sometimes we you know, malaligned, we can't get coaxial guide position. So in some cases it's not possible. And in those cases, you can, you know, wire into the aorta and then snare. Um, you have to make termination. If you cross into the aorta, there are certain CTA operators that will say, you know, I never give that up. I've crossed the occlusion. Why would I pull the wire back? My bias is, you know, I think it's worth investing five to 10 minutes to try and wire the antegrade guide. For those reasons, you know, you can trap and make things a little easier. Um, in this case, as I say, we crossed into the aorta. What the other very important maneuver at this point, if you cross into the aorta, is to push the wire and try and get it up in the subclavian. And just you know, confirm to yourself you're truly in the aorta. It's possible to get subintimal at the aortic level, and then the wire will you know feel not free. And it's possible to go in all sorts of funny places. I've seen cases where the wire is in the PA, etc. So you want to spend a minute and confirm where you are. At this stage of this case, the patient became hypotensive um, with anterior ST elevation. Uh, CTO PCI carries an increased risk of complications and hypotension during CTO PCI is, you know, multifactorial. We always worry about perforation. So we tend to call for an echo immediately. You know, during my fellowship, there were two CTO fellows and one would be doing the case and the other would be doing, you know, serial stat echoes, you know, every 20 minutes. We often use large bore access so vascular access bleeding is not uncommon these patients invariably you know old they have vascular disease their access is hard everything's difficult if you've dissected you may have lost large, large side branches if you're retrograde you may be having you know global ischemia from occluding uh, an important collateral if you have donor vessel ischemia or thrombosis you can get you know catastrophic ischemia because your donor vessel goes down and you have one occluded vessel and, you know, we're often using amplat shaped guides, which can cause, you know, guide-induced aortic regurgitation. In these cases that we're crossing into the aorta, you can cause aortic injuries. Here you can see an injection of the retrograde system, and you can see an occlusion of the mid-LAD. The ACT at this point was 360, and we always say for retrogrades, as soon as you go retrograde, you get the ACT up to 350 and above, for this reason, because of the risk of donor vessel thrombosis. So we ballooned it, and we restored flow. And within a five minutes, same thing, ST elevation, uh, hypotension. And, you know, we have this occlusion again with the current thrombosis and we balloon it again. And I think on this injection, you can appreciate there's clearly a myocardial bridge there, which is predisposing us to thrombus formation where all of our retrograde equipment is. So we have a few different options here. One is that we can give up on the retrograde option. We certainly can't place a stent, which we would do if this was being caused by a lesion, but this is not. It's being caused by an intramyocardial segment. So at this point, we decided to maintain the ACT above 400. We actually gave a tyrofiban bolus, which is almost never done in CTO PCI due to the you know, risks of bleeding and perforation and magnifying those. I was particularly upset because I knew as the fellow 
responsible for this case, I'd be dealing with two eight French sheaths with an ACT of 450 and Tyra Fiban on board. But, you know, that was the dissection, the decision that was made. We went forward with completing the case. This is us snaring an RG3. An RG3 is a 330 centimeter wire that you use for externalization. So you pass it from the retrograde equipment all the way through and out the anti-grade guide. There are two different externalization wires. The RG3 is 010, so it's a little easier to pass, but it's a little flimsier with less support and more prone to kinking. And the R350 is an 014, so what we're more used to working with. I just want to, you know, so here you can see, this is the retrograde guide. This is, you know, the micro catheter and wires course through the septum back out in through the RCA guide. So this is the configuration we have in every retrograde case. I want you, everyone just to pay attention. The left guide is backed all the way out because when you are withdrawing your micro catheter after, you know, externalizing, because everything is connected, your guide is going to suck in. Uh, and so if you don't back it out, you can get risk of left main dissection. This is another important reason. We still have that wire in the LAD the entire time, you know, and then we just complete the case conventionally stenting Ivis, and this is the final result. So lesson, and then you can see, always perform your check angio. You want to look at the collaterals, make sure there's no bleeding, and you want to check the donor vessel, make sure you don't have guide injury or any other issues. And you can see that my intramyocardial segment, which gave us so many problems. So... Lessons from that case, retrograde is, via septals is safer than trying to traverse a 100 millimeter occlusion antegrade. If you can't wire the antegrade guide, you always have the option of a snare. Maintenance of ACTs above 350 is mandatory in retrogrades, and you've got to get there quickly due to risks of donor vessel complications. Donor vessel complications can be catastrophic, and the presence of a safety wire in your distal donor vessel is mandatory in all cases. And always perform that check angiogram at the end. Have you injured the collateral? Is there a donor vessel issue? And obviously, in this case, we had that specific issue of the myocardial bridge. Very brief on microcatheters. We use them in every single case. You know, they significantly alter the characteristics of the wire. So the tip load of a wire, which is naked, is significantly less than one that's backed up with a microcatheter. So you increase your support. You increase your tip load. It means we can rapidly exchange wires without losing progress. Sometimes in cases, like I said, we want different shapes. You need a big hook to get into a septal, and then you need a small hook to navigate the septal. We never use over-the-wire balloons in CTO-PCI. The microcatheters are easier to track. They're less prone to kinking, and you know where you are all the time because the distal markers are at the tip. As a default, 135 for antegrade, 150 for retrograde. Use your lower profile microcatheters for retrogrades most commonly. Know which microcatheters that you can talk, like the Turnpike and Corsair families, and which you can't, like the Caravel. And only rotate them when you need to. You know, when the fellows have been in cases, I'm trying to get you to spin all the time just for practice. And that's particularly if we're doing, you know, just a wire exchange antegrade. But if you're going retrograde, each microcatheter has, you know, a shelf life of a certain number of spins. And when you exceed that, the microcatheter fatigues. And that either means you then get the tip damaged or you get gripping of the wire and microcatheter and you can't move it. At that stage, you either need to take that microcatheter out or sometimes the interaction and gripping is such you also have to take the wire out. So only spin at the portion that you need to, particularly when you're going retrograde. And don't over-rotate. You know, when you rotate, allow everything to then unfurl and relax. Um, this is a video, you know, as I say, you, most of your movement needs to be with this hand. And then you're just transmitting with this one. And you can see every once in a while, this operator will, you know, stop and let some of that tension out of the system and let the turns relax. And he's trying to take a very, you know, this particular bend in the septum is often very, very challenging. And sometimes we actually have to dilate that portion with a, a low profile balloon before being able to advance a microcatheter. But this is just, you know, I've been trying with the fellows to show you know how we like to spin the microcatheters and this is just a demonstration of that a very brief note about dual lumen microcatheters people know i'd like to use these a lot in non-cto and in cto cases and they're getting an expanding role in cto pci um, and they you know have multi-utility if your proximal cap like we said before has it got a large side branch at its origin what will happen most times with a deep normal microcatheter is that the wire will prolapse into the side branch. Your wire always wants to take the path of least resistance. And if there's an open versus a closed vessel, it will go in the open one. So you can put a wire there, 
bring a dual lumen microcatheter down, and that will then increase your penetration force towards the occlusion and can help you. If your initial wire goes subintimal, you can use the dual lumen microcatheter to help a parallel wire attempt. So you leave one wire subintimal, you advance a dual lumen over that, you hopefully plug the subintimal space and make it less likely for you to go in there. And through the dual lumen microcatheter, you try and then re-enter uh, or you try and get parallel. If there are important side branches after you've crossed antegrade, use the dual lumen to access the side branch so you're not trying to re-traverse the whole occlusion with a new wire with a chance of picking up plaque. And if you've crossed retrograde and you want to work on an antegrade system, then use the dual lumen microcatheter to take out your externalization wire and put your wires in the distal vessel. And, you know, it's very useful also for wiring jailed side branches after stenting because then you're sure you're not behind struts. And it's also good, you know, in cases of no reflow, you don't have to give up your wire position to give your distal drugs. So I like these a lot. Uh, some people use it instead of a stingray balloon for ADR. This is, you know, less recommended because we already have a custom made tool for dissection reentry. So I want to cover a few other, you know, just fundamental points for overviews of CTO PCI. One is how do we confirm our wires in the distal true lumen? The first thing to say is you have to do that. You can't proceed with your PCI until you know that your distal wire is in the true lumen. You don't want to be guessing and advancing when you don't know where you are. Wire perforations tend to be relatively well tolerated, but it's when you follow them with balloons and microcatheters and IVUS catheters that you can then make a very big hole, which can become catastrophic. The way to confirm your distal true lumen wire position is via your retrograde contrast injection. It's one of the reasons we always do every case with bilateral injections so that you don't have any guesswork. And so what we will do is when we think we're across, we'll take a Cine, we'll inject the retrograde. And once we see the contrast filling and we think we're in the lumen, we'll continue to drive that wire forward and confirm. We like to do that in two orthogonal views if there's any doubt, because you can get forward occasionally. There are rare cases where, you know, you don't have retrograde filling for whatever reason. Um, this is a you know slightly worrisome situation because you're never entirely sure. If you are pretty confident you're within the architecture of the vessel and you haven't perforated, you could advance your microcatheter and then exchange your CTO crossing wire for a workhorse wire. And if that workhorse wire easily advances and it finds multiple side branches, that's pretty convincing that you're luminal. You can also aspirate and get return of blood through the microcatheter. The caveat to that is if you have a very large subintimal hematoma, you'll also get a lot of return of blood. We don't re routinely recommend IVUS to be your first confirmation of distal true lumen position because there's a risk of you extending the dissection. Similarly, we really don't recommend distal tip injection. If you're not luminal, you're going to have a huge amount of staining and you're going to collapse the true lumen with by hydraulically extending your dissection plane. So those are not recommended maneuvers for confirming your distal true lumen wire position. You can avoid this quandary by always having um, your bilateral injections. The second kind of like fundamental point is that you never complete the PCI over the CTO wire you've crossed with. This is regardless of whether it's a soft wire or whether it's a stiff wire, because either of those wires are going to hurt you in the distal vessel. They're going to be more likely to dissect and to perforate. The exceptions to this are, um, you know, we have cases where the microcatheter won't follow the wire, and then you will need to do at least some work uh, over your crossing wire. In those cases, you just need to be very careful. Don't have your wire all the way out in the distal vessel. Have very good control of it. Do your proximal work that you need to do. And that's just to facilitate delivery of the microcatheter and then exchange your wire. Uh, as I say, the crossing wires are all more hazardous than the non-crossing wires. If you're worried about support, you can use, you know, a non-jacketed support wire like a wiggle or a grand slam or something like that. But, you know, our default is to use a workhorse. And your options, as we all know, are either trapping, hydro, hydraulic exchange or hydroplaning or guide wire extensions. Just make sure that the extension you are calling for is the one compatible with the wire that you've crossed with. I think Asahi has their own one and Abbott has one. I prefer trapping and, you know, it when we do hydraulic exchanges, there's invariably often motion of the wire. That might be okay with a workhorse and you're exchanging a workhorse. It's really not okay with a stiff wire or a polymer jacketed wire. So the, we prefer trapping because it's more reliable. You don't get motion of the wire and you also, you can save radiation. You know, we, we try to be 
cognizant of radiation in all of these cases. And after the first one second or half a second of confirming the trap has worked, you can just take your foot off fluoro. I personally prefer the trapper balloon because I don't have to worry about the different size fitting the guide. It's one size to fit all guides. It's very resistant to kinking. And, you know, we might use it three or four times in a case. Um, if you don't want to use the trapper, you can use, you know, two and a half balloon and a six French. You need to use a bigger balloon, a seven or eight. I'd recommend using a longer balloon to increase the area of contact with the balloon and the wire. Um, if you've got a short guide, a 90 centimeter guide, just be careful because you, you can more easily advance the balloon out of the guide. Again, the trapper has a nice feature where you can configurate it to 90 or 100. And then when you get it hub, that's as far as it goes. Um, but if you're not using a conventional balloon, just be careful with the 90 cm guides. And always, you know, you have to never forget this step of back bleeding because when you remove the microcatheter, that space that was occupied by the microcatheter gets replaced by air. And it's really very, you know, it's a large amount of air. When you back bleed the TUI, you get like a dozen large bubbles. And if you're not vigilant and you've forgotten, and then, you know, five minutes later you inject, you know, you're, you're going to send all that air down the coronary. And if it's particularly if that's in the retrograde, that's going to be catastrophic. So, yeah, I like the trapper. As I say, you can set it to the length you want. You can use it multiple times in a case. It doesn't kink. You can always find it on the back table because it's bright orange. Everyone knows where it is. The trap liner is um, something, uh, it's a mixture of the guide extension and the trapper balloon in one unit. It's made by Teleflex. So, the guide extension portion is the same as the guide liner. It's available six, seven, and eight. I'll use it in nearly every CTO, particularly in the right coronary where. You know, I'm less worried about, you know, um, using a guide extension than if I'll you always use a trap liner because then you have the built in trapper balloon. You can occasionally damage the balloon uh, advancing equipment. Uh, and there are cases where the back end of the trap liner has split. So you have to be a little careful. But it's a, say, it's a good uh, piece of equipment because it combines your guide extension and your trapper balloon in one. I'll show another quick case here. You know, sometimes. You know, whenever we cross an occlusion, you know, everyone wants to like high five and back slap. And sometimes crossing with the wire is the easiest part of the case. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes that is the end, more or less the end of the case. But more often than not in these vessels, you know, the work only begins after you cross. This is a patient that's a very familiar configuration for, you know, CTO programs, which is a patient who has a remote history of bypass grafting. All the veins are occluded. The lemma is the only patent graft. All the native vessels are CTO and they've had angina for years and have either had no attempts or a couple of attempts and, and people have tried to you know, treat them medically. This got referred uh, to us when I was a, a fellow at Columbia after a previous failed attempt. They actually couldn't engage a guide antegrade because you know there's, it's an osteal occlusion with stents. Uh, these septals they couldn't access uh, safely. You can see here maybe that there's a conus branch which will be useful. So that's what we did. We set ourselves up with an eight French guide. We couldn't selectively engage, but we were able to drop a wire in the conus branch, use an anchor balloon, then orient our guide and start working antigrade. So that's what we're doing here. The Miracle family of wires have, you know, not a huge role in contemporary CTO PCI, but their characteristic that makes them very useful in certain cases is that they are supportive all the way up to the tip of the wire. And what that means is even if you can't get a lot of wire purchase, you still get support from the body of the wire and you can advance your microcatheter in. It can be useful in cases like this. It can be useful in cases where you have uh, stent struts, which are jailing your occluded vessel. You can just, if you can nose in the miracle, you can then follow with the microcatheter because it's supportive the whole way. We then exchanged for more, you know, talkability to a Gaia wire. Um, and, you know, we managed to make some progress. I think this is one of those, you know, really long fluoro stores we make, but you can see here, the wire is going forward. This is that maneuver that we always do, retrograde contrast injection, contrast fills. You think you're in and you advance, you confirm you are in. But we couldn't advance the microcatheter because of this resistant ISR. And, you know, on stents, often you can damage the microcatheter on, you know, underexpanded stents and it can catch. And in fact, we had to take everything out as a single unit because we got that phenomenon of microcatheter fatigue and then you get gripping of the wire and microcatheter. So we recross with the miracle to take advantage again of that supportive body. And then that allows us to advance our microcatheter through. Balloons don't expand and often, you know, as I say, when you cross the occlusion, 
the work is kind of only just starting. This IVAS run confirmed that we were in the lumen of the stent throughout, but you can see here severely underexpanded stents in the proximal RCA. Uh, and you can see here, you know, complete underexpansion of the balloon. So we took a laser, multiple runs with contrast. Uh, we felt safe as we were in the stented segment. A little better, but still not full release. And in fact, we couldn't, still couldn't deliver equipment to treat distally. So we took a rotor blade at this stage, the 2 burr wouldn't cross. So we started with a 175 burr, and then we upsized to the 215 burr. And then you can see here, this is a shorter IVAS run, but you know, after the laser and the bearing and more ballooning, you can see that you know, we have a much better appearance of that proximal RCA. I'll let it play to the, play to the end. And then you know, we stared, we did an osteo flash to try and help access in the future. And this is the final result. And that case is, you know, just to highlight that, you know, you don't ever want to relax when you've crossed the occlusion and think, you know, the case is done. That's often when all of the main challenges are starting. That's the, you know, we use IVAS to optimize all of our results and that's the distal and that's the proximal. I'm gonna cover a few other things, you know, very briefly. One is when to treat the CTO versus non-CTO. No universal answer. You have to do it case by case basis. You don't normally do them both at the same time. I think the historical paradigm was probably to try the CTO first. And if you're unsuccessful for, for bypass surgery, I don't think that's a, you know, a logical or correct approach. I think you need to decide the overall best revascularization strategy for the patient. And then you need to you know, successfully achieve that. My bias and default approach would be to have the non-CTO lesions treated first. I think that makes tackling the CTO safer. You're less likely to have ischemia and non-CTO vessels. It also increases your options for your crossing. You may see collaterals you didn't see before. Um, you also, you know, if you have a severe stenosis in the donor vessel, it's not going to be safe for you to use that for a retrograde approach. You're either going to get ischemia from blocking it or you're going to get thrombosis. People often worry about jailing septals. Uh, and making things difficult for a retrograde for a right coronary CTO, it's, you know, that's really not an issue. We can essentially never have a problem getting into jailed septal branches. Um, one brief mention of what we're doing more and more these days to enhance the safety of the procedures and you know, partially the efficiencies. When you find yourself at a portion of the case where you don't think you're going to successfully enter the distal true lumen, rather than taking on a very hazardous collateral at that point, do a star procedure. So, you know, advance a polymer jacketed wire knuckled, antegrade through the entire artery subintimately, let it re enter wherever it will. Normally, re enters distally at the site of a bifurcation. Resist the temptation to stent because you're either going to or possibly both lose the side branches and, you know, long subintimal stents have poor patency. We know that from when the star procedure first came out. But just POBA, get Timmy through flow don't stent, and then you can bring the patient back for a repeat attempt after the dissection planes have healed. You can often, you know, much easier navigate your way through and have a much shorter subintimal passage. Um, this is, you know, uh, something that the field has really taken on board in the last year or two, and I think it's, it's improving the safety of our procedures. When to start a case, essentially never perform, I wouldn't say never, there are very rare cases that you should do an ad hoc CTO PCI. Uh, I have a case where I, of, I can show another time of the time we did a retrograde reverse cut at 2 a.m. for cardiogenic shock, but that's very, 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 very uncommon. These tend to be stable patients. Um, that was a case of a patient who had an occluded vein graft that we couldn't, you know, safely open due to thrombus. But in general, if you see a CTO, uh, don't tackle it ad hoc because you want to plan the case properly. You want the staff in the room briefed. You want the right equipment there. You want the dual injections. You don't want to be tired when you're starting the case. You want to minimize radiation and contrast. And importantly, you want those dual injections for every case. And we often don't have them. If you start a case and it turns into a CTO that you didn't anticipate, you know, one option is stopping. Another option is always to get your retrograde, especially in the, the era of radial. You can just get radial access and you can inject the donor vessel so you have distal visualization. But in general, as a general rule, I'd say no ad hoc CTO PCR. When to stop a case, you know, complications, futility. Each lab will have their own threshold, but if you haven't crossed after five gray, or if you've reached a lot more than that, and you're not at a case point that you're going to complete the case imminently, stop. Contrast dependent, and if you feel that the risk of continuing is going to outweigh the benefit. So this is going to be very brief, step by step. Two attendings is default. You know, me and Glenn have been doing these cases 
together. And I think it's very helpful. And Jeff and John have been very forgiving with the schedule to allow us to do that. It's, you know, reduces operator fatigue. We can switch roles during the case. If one of us isn't available, we'll ask it someone else in the lab to help us or whoever's on the floor. I think it makes our cases safer. I think it makes them more efficient. No ad hoc attempt. Default at the moment is eight French femoral for the anti-grade and seven French radial for the retrograde. I'd like to move towards biradial. We've done one or two. It's nice to walk away from a case and not have to worry about the groin. I mean, I pre-close all of the eights. We don't tend to have an issue, but you know, these patients, as I said, they're all old. They all have vascular disease. Uh, in Europe, biradial is very much the default. I'd like us to start doing that. Dual access in every case. So even if you don't have a retrograde donor vessel, for you, if you all the collaterals are ipsilateral, you still need two access points because you're going to use a ping pong guide if you cross retrograde. And again, I have case of that that I can show people in another time. Two guide casts is default unless we've decided upfront no retrograde attempts. That's a decision I like to make in advance of the case. My integrate system in every case essentially is a six French trap liner, any one three five microcatheter that you can talk. A workhorse wire to engage the occlusion and then the gladius mongo which i've been you know telling people about it's a medium tip load polymer jacketed wire that's very good for knuckling it's also very good for duct finding the distal true lumen it's really versatile wire and then from that point on wire escalation antigrade depends on the nature of the case always have that safety wire in your distal retrograde vessel always have your act above 300 for antigrade above 350 for retrograde reverse with protamine in nearly every case unless it's the most straightforward antigrade wiring case if you're going retrograde you know you have your 90 cm guiding already i engage the septals with that c on with a large bend get a 150 microcatheter in switch to a c on black with a small bend and try and navigate the septal if it's very torturous use a very soft wire like a suo3 I always prefer to wire the anti-grade guide off over snaring because of that benefit of being able to trap your retrograde wire. I would work over the externalized wire as default. So that's the wire that's going all the way from the retrograde up the anti-grade because you get very good support. If you have major side branches, use the dual lumen microcatheter to convert to a default anti-grade conventional system. I would say avoid epicardials in nearly every case. If the epicardial is the only strategy left, I'll do a star and reattempt. And if we're going to do an epicardial, I'd specifically consent the patient for that ahead of time. As soon as you go sub interval and you want to do anti-grade dissection re-entry, bring your trap liner down as far as it goes to block inflow of blood, get a damp pressure trace, stop the hematoma expanding, and never inject until you've stented the artery fully. Get the knuckled mongo wire beyond the distal cap for a reasonable target zone. You can then bring the stingray over the Mongo. We used to stop and exchange to a Miracle 12, but you don't need to do that. The Mongo has enough body. And then I like the Gaia third. We don't have this wire the next because it's a good mixture of, you know, uh, talkability and stiffness to try and do the re-entry. If it's calcified, use the, a very stiff wire. Stick and drive in every case, which means when you re-enter the distal true lumen with the stiff wire, just keep it there and do your exchange. We used to say stick and uh, swap where we swap to a jacketed wire. In conclusion, you know, CTO-PCI is a different procedure to conventional PCI. I do think it needs a different skill set. And although it doesn't need different or specific credentialing, I think it's you know, better to consider it in the same way we do structural or peripheral procedures, something a little bit different. Uh, there have been improvements in technology and expertise. The procedure is getting more efficient and reliable and safe. But you know, despite all of that, the risks are greater than non-CTO-PCI. So you need to have very judicious case selection. And I thank everyone there. Yusuf, thank you for an excellent talk. I think there's so many points we could take off and like branches on a tree, we could end up going all the way to the leaf level, but that was a great overview from 30,000 feet. Um, I think we'd like to encourage everybody uh, to think about these cases ahead of time when you see the patients with the CTOs to get the set up angios. And we're more than happy uh, to work with you, to, to do the patients with you rather than kind of take them ourselves. We want this skill set to be translated to everybody in the lab. And a lot of the tools and techniques that were discussed today uh, can apply for complex PCI cases as well. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk, Yusuf. See if you have any questions.